What's going on, podcast listeners? My name is Michael Chernow. I am a restaurateur and lifestyle entrepreneur, and I am truly obsessed with living a life better than yesterday through wellness, fitness, and good vibes. I've always wondered if the drive to succeed is something we are born with or if it's something that is made over time through grit, drive, and perseverance. I get to answer that question exactly, and the goal of this podcast is to talk with people that have absolutely crushed it in life and have inspired me to do the same. This is Born or Made. What's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Born or Made podcast. I have a guest on today that I've known probably for six ish, seven years, maybe. Um, I met Chelsea Wilkins when I was training at the Soho Strength Lab. Chelsea is a holistic personal coach, personal trainer. She is a yoga practitioner. She teaches yoga. She, she holds yoga treats all over the globe. She's a nutritional expert. She's a gymnast and she is one bad ass lady. Um, I'm really fired up to have Chelsea on the show today because she's inspired me over the years. Um, there's been so many times where I've come so close to being like, hey, Chelsea, will you, uh, will you coach me? And for whatever reason, I, got, I get sidetracked. But um, Chelsea, I, I'm super grateful to have you on the show. Welcome aboard. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I can't believe it's been that long, but um, absolutely. It's nice to work around and work next to those who inspire you the most. You know, um, I opened up a restaurant across the street from the Soho Strength Lab in 2015, and I had been training there, I think, for like six months. As I was building the restaurant, I started training there, and I always saw you in there, and most of the time, you were in a handstand. Um, hold on one second. I can't have that here. Lie down, buddy. Lie down. Lie down. Lie down. There you go. Stay. Um. Most of the time you were in either a handstand or deadlifting like 225 pounds, like it was like, like, like nothing. And I said to myself, man, this, this woman is so impressive and so humble at the same time. Um, and so, you know, I, 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 we, we got to know each other a little bit over the years and I just, I, I've always been inspired by you. And so the idea of this podcast is, is for me to sit down with people that have inspired me um, and many, many others. Obviously, you've inspired many, many others. You have an incredible um, audience and a, and a following, dedicated, loyal following um, on social media and in person. Um, and I get to sit down and, and ask you uh, whether you think you were born to do what you do today or if you were made over time. And we get there through hearing your story. I'm really interested in hearing your story because I really don't know much outside of the fact that I believe you were an acrobat in the circus. Um, uh, but I would love for yeah. you to go back as far as you can with us uh, to give us to give us the, the scoop on Chelsea and, and maybe introduce yourself um, probably better than, than I did. Um, well, that was quite an introduction. So I think you did um, a great job. Um, I have been in New York, um, in and out of New York for about 12 years now. I grew up in Nevada, um, in the mountains, and um, was born in Texas, actually on a military base. So if that gives you, it starts to give you an idea of the kind of structure that I grew up around. But um I loved gymnastics. So I started gymnastics very young. It's how I spent all day, every day. If you ask my parents, I was always in a leotard, always in a swimsuit and always trying to exercise or climb on everything I saw. Um, so it made sense that fitness as a profession was a natural transition when I moved to New York. I am. Um, in high school, joined the circus as a, as a retired gymnast always does and, um, and intended to be a performer in New York. And that worked out pretty well for the first year that I was here and had a pretty bad injury on my shoulder and realized that I am better off teaching and really teaching people how their body functions. Um, I coached gymnastics for 
about 10 years. I coached for the Special Olympics for gymnastics in Nevada for 10 years. Um, and then started training and teaching adults really how their body moves and how to connect themselves to ourselves. I've been talking a lot about any professional athlete. We love to do the thing that we're good at and we love to be the best at what we are, but really that brings us further out of balance and further away from our center. So I like to focus on my work with the clients that I have is to level off whatever our favorite thing is and really train your imbalances or whatever you might be ignoring because we're not good at it and we don't like to do things that we're not good at and really kind of find work to find your center and learn how to actually listen to what you need instead of just what you want. Wow. I love that concept. <laughs> you know, um, so growing up in Nevada is, I mean, it's one of the most beautiful places in the country for sure, parts of it. Um, and, you know, I read in your bio that you grew up uh, doing mountain sports. So mountain sports, you mean like rock climbing, mountain biking, things like that? Yeah, I think all of the above between post gymnastics, between snowboarding and wakeboarding and climbing and cliff diving. And um, Nevada is a pretty lawless place. So really anything you can get away with. And, and when you were coming up, you know, you said that you, as early as you can remember, you were really just sort of dialed in on gymnastics and climbing things. And I mean, do you remember a moment in time that you were like, this is what I'm going to do, or this is what I want to do, or why you were actually going after it the way you were? I, I mean, I remember we moved around a lot when I was really young because military. So I remember a time in Oregon that I, in a swimsuit, because always, um, would put on workout videos and Jane Fonda and work out to exercise videos constantly because I just felt connected to movement. And um, so it kind of just made sense. And I was lucky enough um, when I became a gymnast to train under Stoyan Delchev, who won the 86 Olympics for Bulgaria. So I was kind of brought up with an Eastern European discipline. And that, um, that always made sense to me that that kind of drive um, was always really satisfying. It never felt like a stress or obligation. You know, as someone who's a, a, a professional or was a professional athlete who is a fitness professional, nutrition professional, um, what are there moments in, in, in your life where you've had to take a significant amount of time off of fitness? No, <laughs> um, I have had a lot of injuries and I was talking to somebody today who's a ballerina. And I think when you, especially when you think of the diet of a gymnast is maybe we still had weekly weigh-ins, which can be negative on certain people, but I always treated food as something that gives you fuel and you have to eat properly to build your energy. So it was never a negative relationship with, um, with restriction, but always, are you getting enough of the right things? So I think when you approach your body about giving it what it needs and not kind of forcing through things, you just start to listen in a different way and you don't burn out. I, you know, fitness has been a huge part of my life, as you know, um, for years, for a long time. And I could honestly say that I don't think I've taken any significant amount of time off of training, uh, any significant amount of time, obviously, uh, you know, three to five days here, you know, every once in a while. But I just, you know, when I talk to someone like you, who I know is grounded and has a sort of full circle approach um, holistically to wellness. What the, you know, is it healthy to take a break from fitness uh, if you are a fitness enthusiast, professional, you know, nut job? Uh, is it healthy to take breaks and be comfortable with taking breaks? I think, especially as New York 
workers, we tend to burn the candle on both ends. Um, and it's important to not stress if you are on holiday for a week, enjoy yourself and do your thing. I, I think that if you're exercising in balance, if you have a stressful week, then maybe you should do some yoga or go for a swim and not do a 50 mile run that week. Like it's, you need to understand what your body really needs, but you're not going to derail your progress by taking time off. You're only going to let your body heal and really understand what your body needs. Um, so I think it is, it is important, especially if you need it, because I think that a lot of us aren't in tune with listening to what we need and we take it to the extreme. Let's talk about listening to the body for a little bit, because I know that's a big part of, of, of your practice. What is that? What does that mean? Like, what does it mean to actually listen to your body via, you know, fitness, nutrition mindset? I think that when you think about your ultimate goal, whether that is aesthetic or energetic or emotional, it's when you, it's what brings you peace. So if having a certain aesthetic is your piece and that is that doesn't feel stressful to you it feels like you're pulling into your best self or where you feel comfortable then then maybe that's your answer and that is your end goal and maybe if you're somebody who had disordered eating in the past maybe being able to eat and not stress about overeating or not um, obsess over certain things, maybe that's your end goal. So I think that it shows up differently for everyone. But, uh, but I guess that what I, what I, what I was, what I meant by the question is, are there triggers or sort of signs that you can give the audience um, that could potentially give somebody an, an opportunity to push pause? Like if they're like, I've got to just go to the gym or you know, um, is there, is there any, any, any sort of signs that you could, you could share with us that um, would be really beneficial for us to actually listen and not go? Absolutely. I think that our body has a way of forcing us to pay attention. So if you don't listen to it and you don't tune into what you need, it will speak louder and it will show up in pain. It'll show up in disruption of your health or disruption of your sleep. So oftentimes if you wake up in the middle of the night, especially between three and five in the morning, that can start to explain oxidative health, that your body is overstressed, you're running on your cortisol, you're not able to fall into your REM cycle and your adrenals aren't functioning in the way that they should be. You can also start to understand that as your 3 p.m. crash of energy. So when you start needing coffee and needing different things to balance you out, you're reaching to external things instead of finding internally what can relieve the stress or what can kind of refuel your adrenals or other organ function to, um, to help you feel good and to help you function in full energy and, um, and let go of anxiety or stress because all of those things are a tipping scale, right? It's symptom of a larger cause anxiety is not the cause it's just your body being like you're not listening mm. when you're injured and i'm sorry for asking such specific questions but because i have someone like you on i think it's so important to be able to like you know some of these podcasts are really story focused and others are really sort of informative i think this is going to be a really informative one because i notice how knowledgeable you are about this stuff so if somebody's injured and they or, you know, like, do you recommend taking the, 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 the you know, prescribed time off um, if you're, if you're injured, but you start feeling a lot better? It depends on the injury, right? If you break your wrist, does that mean you shouldn't be active? Absolutely not. Um, if you got an injury because you are doing ultra marathons and you constantly burn yourself out, then that's probably a sign that you are pushing too hard. I know that if I go below a certain percent body fat, my joints start to hurt. So you start to kind of tune into what you need. But if you have an ankle injury, you should start to ask yourself, what else can you do to heal your body? 
So that's not necessarily a physical practice. Maybe if you're forced to have downtime, then maybe that's the time that you really tune into your nutrition and you do emotional work. Maybe you start meditating. So you start to have different outlets for your stress or for healing or strengthening your body. Um, I think that's great advice. The, um, the nutritional component uh, of, of this world of wellness uh, is such a tricky one. I know for me personally, uh, what I've been focused on for the last three years has really been this, this bodybuilding stuff, which has been such an, inc- like, obviously, I, I mean, I love the training. The nutrition was something that I, I really had to get used to. It was really intense. But on both sides of the coin, like eating an enormous amount more than I was used to or comfortable with, and then eating far less than I am comfortable with, uh, based on where I'm at in a season. Nutrition, in my opinion, from my experience, is 90 something percent of the battle, right? I, I think it's, I think getting people. I also would I also would argue to say and and, may, and I could be wrong because I'm not a, 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 a personal trainer, but I would say 90% of the people that are actually getting after it uh, are focused on aesthetics really, really want to look a certain way and I don't think there's anything wrong with that I actually think that that is, is amazing and great right if that's what if that's what is going to give you longevity is that if that's what's going to keep you healthy focusing on and investing in yourself, I'm all for it. I'm one of those guys. I definitely like to look good because looking good makes me feel good. And when I feel good, then I can be of service to others. And so like what nutrition is specific and it's not like you can't prescribe everybody the same exact protocol. What do you think is the, is the, you know, if you had to choose one style of, of eating, what would you say, you know, is the one that makes the most sense right now? I think for what works for the most people is focusing on two things is focusing on hitting a protein goal and hitting a water goal. And I think that if you can consistently hit those two things, then you can start to worry about your macros. You can start to think about should I have less fat? Should I have more carbs? How do I balance this? Am I getting the right nutrition? But until you have the protein goal and the water goal on lock, the other things don't matter as much. Um, how you're fueling your body, having consistency, being aware of the consistency is really going to change more than doing a complete overhaul because um, it's overwhelming. If you do too much, one, you don't know what it was that made the greatest benefit or you don't know what didn't work for you. So it, it ends up being more of an all or nothing thing where if you start, hit your goals consistently and then you can kind of fine tune the details. Can you unpack that a little bit? Why, why protein out of all the macros or you know, why protein out of the three macros and, and why, why water? Why are those two things in your opinion the most important to focus on? I think for the most part, clients come to me with, like you said, um, with an aesthetic goal that they want to lean out. They want to be more toned. So the easiest way to create tone is to put on a little muscle and protein will help you do that. So if, if your body is, if your body needs to recover from a hard workout, protein is going to help you along. Um, so often we calorie restrict. I'm so sick of hearing trainers tell clients, if you want to lose weight, just be in a caloric deficit. And then the person you're working with is eating a thousand calories. They have no energy to do anything and they're not reaping the benefits of all of their hard work. So if you're dealing with somebody who is actually working out and trying really hard to get somewhere, if they're under eating, you're causing the problem. Um, so I think that encouraging them to focus on what they need to recover, what they need to build and be successful, how to build a strong foundation, not what you take away from somebody, not only creates better emotional strength, but you're building your physical strength um, for the goal. 
I couldn't agree more. I think protein is uh, everybody, you know, so many people talk about carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates are like the hot topic for years. It's not even, it's not a new thing, right? Like carbohydrates are, it's a confusing, it's a confusing macro. Everybody thinks it makes you fat, which I actually know for sure 1000 million percent carbohydrates. I mean, if you're eating pizza and fucking pasta all day long, yes, you're going to be, you know, you're not going to, you're, you're, you know, it's going to be, a, it's going to be trouble, but carbohydrates, I eat it. I eat an enormous amount of carbohydrates all the time. I am um, always, if I eat more carbs, I am leaner and I am happier. I tried keto. Um, I tried keto back when I was very, very lean and it made me put on body fat. I was never at a hundred percent energy. I was cranky. I was not a nice person to be around. I had to promise my partner to never do it again. Cause I, I wasn't a good version of me. And really when I focus on hitting a higher carb, I'm less likely to binge eat the next day. I sleep better. I have better energy and a better output into my physical work that I've put in. All right. So I, I want to, I want to, I want to continue talking about nutrition because I think it's so important. And I, and um, I love, I love your thought on, you know, when you're meeting with somebody that really is just trying to get into it, you, you, you prescribe two things, water and protein. So if somebody's listening and they're trying to, you know, break into it or get back into fitness and, and they know nutrition is the path to greatness in, in the world of wellness, what do you, what would you say pro, like for someone who's trying to just start protein wise, what would you prescribe, a, you know, female 120 pounds looking to get into it? So as long as they have no outlying um, issues, they have healthy kidney function, healthy organ function, trying to hit about 100 grams of protein would make a huge difference in their body composition. 100 grams of protein. And, and do, you do, the, do you prescribe the same for men and women? Um, it depends on how active the person is. I think a man can often handle more and metabolize protein differently. Um, so with a man, I think also when I work with men, they have more of a hypertrophy goal. They're trying to put on a bit more size um, than just maintaining size and putting on more muscle. So you would say kind of like based on that, you would, you would say for a female starting out let's give you, let's do like 0.75 uh, grams of protein per body fat. And then mm -hmm. would you say for a male uh, starting out with a goal of probably wanting to put on some muscle and shred, shred down one, one and a quarter grams of, of protein per gram of, per pound of body fat? I mean, of course it is more personal than that, but, but yeah, I think that when you focus on those numbers and you hit it consistently and ultimately you see what works for you. If you kind of hit a ballpark and then you're, you do this for two weeks and you start to understand, okay, I actually feel better if I get more, or I was hitting that number and I was really bloated. Maybe I try a different protein source or maybe a little bit less works better for me. So you start to understand, especially depending on what your workouts are that day. I know that if I'm doing cardio one day versus strength training, I will have a different macrobiotic ratio because it makes me feel better and it makes, helps me recover differently. What kind of protein do you like? What's your favorite source of protein? In whole food or in supplementation? Whole foods. Whole foods, um, beef. I know, um, so lamb is actually the most easily digested of the red meat. But when it comes to eating animal, if you think about bird, birds eat grain and they eat corn. And those are often things that uh, create inflammation in a lot of people. And it's not very nutritionally dense. So when you eat those things, yes, it's a lean protein. And if you're cutting and you need very specific beans, then that makes sense. It's an easy source to hit those numbers. But when you think about fish and lamb and cow, they eat grass, they eat seaweed, they eat nutritionally dense food full of phytonutrients. So that makes sense that if you're eating those things, um, it has more iron and it has more nutrition. So 
it makes sense, right? Do you, I mean, that's such a great point. I actually, I eat far too much chicken. I just do. I eat far too much chicken. I eat way too much chicken. Uh, and now you're making me think a little bit. Maybe I need to pipe that down a bit. I, you know, I love, I love red meat. I, I, I love red meat. I just got 95 pounds of grass fed, grass <laughs> finished bison uh, sent to me from this amazing farm in uh, Montana called Glacier Grown. I am always curious though, how much red meat can I, or should I eat realistically? If it's clean red meat, like how many days a week is, is it safe to eat red meat? I mean, are you talking about in terms of your arteries or in terms of the economic system? Um, I think a lot of different things come into play, whether you're, um, depending on the reason why you're eating more or less. I think, is it okay for your arteries if you're in your heart, if you're eating that much cholesterol? Yeah, it is. <laughs> balance, balance your food. If you're only eating a certain thing, just like anything, you're throwing yourself out of balance. You, you need to mix it up. You need to have, but I think that eating red meat is not going to cause your problems. If that is your number one issue, then that's great. Then that's something that's very controllable. But, um, and it's easier. So with chicken, often it can affect your hormones, right? It can create more estrogen in your body and that ends up showing up in your pack. So when you see people more from the Midwest and we all store fat in our bodies in different places, often because of different hormonal imbalances or different organ functions. So you're, you start to be able to read the body differently. I can eat chicken every now and then, but when I take it away, I lean out in my chest. So having those better understanding, you're able to be like, is this working for me? If red meat makes you feel like you digest it, and of course it matters how you pair your food, um, what goes in your body first, depend helps determine how your body digests it but i think it's okay to have it every day oh that makes me i know that's so not the popular good. opinion but i think that um i think that makes sense you know I, like i've been hearing a lot about and i think a lot of us have right this carnivore diet and people are you know resorting to only eating red meat period that's it they only eat meat red meat specifically and some, some people that are actually long, like have been doing it for some time. I mean, look, let's also call a spade a spade here. It's just not a sustainable way to live, right? Like you can't only eat beef and bison and elk, you know, and you, you just like, I, I, I feel like that, that, you know, it's that, that's a, that's sort of a, a, a bit of a, of a stint or a trend. It's not, it's certainly not a lifestyle. I consider paleo a lifestyle. Like, I think that you can probably live the paleo nutritional plan forever. I actually really love it. I wish that I was able to eat rice on it because I do eat a fair amount of rice and you can't. So I can't really call myself uh, a, a paleo guy. But um, in, in, in the water arena, what do, you, what do you typically prescribe for water and why? A gallon. A gallon. Um, which is complicated. I was studied nutrition at Cornell and they're like, you don't need a gallon of water. You don't need this. And this isn't sufficient. And in Eastern medicine, they say, they talk about how water dilutes your constitution. So there are lots of <laughs> different opinions. And again, it, of course, I know the annoying answer is that it depends on your activity level, but it's a lot easier to give somebody something, try to hit the goal. And then if you're hitting that goal to taper it away, if it feels like too much, then you take it back. But if you're not having enough and you don't know if our body is made up mostly of water and we need more water and you're dehydrated, your cells are depleted. So it makes sense to fill your cells with water and continue filling so you are the most energetic, the most whole. And if that feels like too much, 
then you can take it away. But if you don't understand what full feels like, then that should be your focus first. Are there any other reasons to drink a lot of water outside of filling your cells? I mean, like, you know, I, whenever somebody, you know, comes to me and says, Hey, Mike, like I'm trying to, I'm trying to step into the, into the world of, of, of better being. Um, one of my, <laughs> there she is. One of my first things I ask is how much water are you drinking? Because I know that one of the first things I check myself on is if I'm tired for any reason, like midday, I, the first thing I say is how much water have I drank? Because I know that when I'm hydrated, I am, I am just a better human being. Um, I also know that, you know, when I'm cutting for a, a competition or something, I up my water intake to about one and a half to two gallons a day, because I also know that water really does help me with, you know, food craving. Um, if I'm really like, if I'm really hungry and I, and I pound a, a glass of water, it kind of goes away. And so weight management is also something that I think water is great for. Are there any other things that you uh, know about, you know, water consumption um, that might be interesting or unique or, you know, something that we, we might not know? I mean, I think that's a great point. If I'm feeling peckish, chances are that if I drink enough water, that will fulfill my craving. Um, but it helps with liver detoxification. So if you think about your, your liver and your organs trying to clean your system, not only do you need protein to detoxify, um, but you need water to help flush your system. So all these things that are like a pro protein detox or you're detoxing with juice doesn't make sense because your body physically needs protein to detoxify. Um, so, but when it comes to water, helping flush your system. So often I do a, I have a large um, pitcher of hibiscus tea that I drink at night to, cause hibiscus helps cleanse your liver and you detoxify most effectively when you sleep. And then in the morning, first thing in the morning, a large pinch of Himalayan or Celtic sea salt, which I juice one whole lime in a large thing of water and drink that first thing in the morning to again, help cleanse my liver. The lime serves as a prebiotic for your gut and the salt literally is fuel for your adrenal. So it helps dampen your cortisol, which is high first thing in the morning. And then the salt gives your adrenal kind of that kick to start running on your natural sustained energy source. How much salt do you do? Um, I do a large pinch. I'd say like an eighth of a teaspoon, but um, a large pinch of Himalayan or kelp salt, mm. which is a great way to stave off belly fat because if you're managing your cortisol levels, you're helping stabilize your belly fat. Pink Himalayan salt is the salt I use. Um, I didn't always use pink Himalayan salt. I know that it's not iodized. And so I wonder, you know, is that something to be concerned about um, pink Himalayan salt not having the iodine that uh, a regular table salt has? Should you be supplementing with iodine if you go straight to pink Himalayan salt? I don't think you need to be supplementing with iodine if you, you, you want a colored salt because it has minerals in it. It has natural recurring minerals. Um, if you want to get iodine, eat seaweed, kelp noodles are a great way, especially for vegan vegetarians, it's a great way to get a clean source of iodine. That can be helpful. Got it. And then, I don't think, yeah, I don't think you need a iodized paper salt. Um, I've just got, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm just hitting you with the barrage. I just think that it's I, like, the, the, I, when I have somebody like you on the podcast that, that's super duper knowledgeable about nutrition, everybody wants to know about nutrition. Everybody wants to know, can I eat carbs? Can I eat carbs? Can I eat fat? Can I not eat fat? How many proteins should I eat? When should I eat it? What do you think about timing on nutrition during the day? Is timing like 
specifically for an active person or an athlete's, you know, obviously a high level athlete's going to have a whole entire schedule around their, their food, but you know, for an enthusiast, what that trains, let's just say trains first thing in the morning. Um, what do you think timing uh, for food should be? I mean, some people can work out on an empty stomach. I am not one of those people. I think that, so for me, I, I need food for fuel. I love a bit of sugar or carbs before a workout. Like you mentioned, I go upside down a lot in my workout. So managing my blood sugar level is really important. But when it comes to the intermittent faster, basically what you're doing, intermittent fasting is great for people who binge eat at night, because ultimately you're just taking away three to 500 calories that they would have had at breakfast. Now you're not changing their lifestyle at all. You're just taking away a meal. So when they overeat at night, it won't be as significant. So you're taking away some calories. So that's helpful. But I think the timing of which you consume your calories matters a lot less. It matters a lot less. Yeah. So do you think eating late at night, you know, let's just say you go to bed at 11. Is there, you know, and I've, and I've honestly from, from experts that I've had on the podcast and just people that I've listened to and uh, just things I've heard over the years. Do you think that there is a cutoff time, you know, how many hours, you know, before you go to bed, you should stop eating. I'm not talking about for weight management. I'm just talking about for general wellness. I mean, if you have a huge meal and then try to go to sleep right away, the chances of that disrupting your sleep and disrupting your digestion and how deeply you sleep, your body digests and restores, is high, right? So it doesn't make sense to eat a big meal and then go straight to bed. So that will have an effect. But is there a don't eat past this time because something will happen? Well, what if you naturally go to sleep at 12? Then maybe stop eating at 10. That's not such a big deal. Um, but do you need to stop eating before two hours? Well, what are you eating? You know, it depends how, how you eat your food makes a big difference. So if I have, um, if I have pasta with tomato sauce, not only that's going to spike my blood sugar immediately because it's carbs and acid, so that, that spike of blood sugar is going to change how I digest that acidic food. It's going to change um, because my blood sugar is now here. It's going to change how I go into my REM cycle and will disrupt my circadian rhythm. But if I eat pasta with cheese, it's not going to spike my blood sugar as much. It's not going to be as disruptive. And my body metabolizes dairy just fine. So it is actually a better option for me. So it, it does depend on the timing of your food, what you ate, and did you spike your blood sugar? Are you pretty stable? Did you have fat, fiber, or protein before your carbs? Because those things, those questions are going to make a much larger difference on the quality of your sleep, the quality of your detoxification and digestion than it is what time it is before you fell asleep. Wow. So you're saying mac and cheese at night. <laughs> No, no spaghetti and meatballs. Um, no spaghetti and marinara. No spaghetti marinara, right. Um, um, but pair, yeah, pairing fat with your carbs is really important. That's great. I, I had no idea. Um, I would love, I want to ask you one more question about nutrition, two more questions about nutrition. And then I, I, um, I would love to talk about sleep for a little bit because I know how important sleep is to my programming in general in life just as a person um but i would love to ask you about um just to let's just get the carbohydrate question out of the out of the way because everybody wants to know uh are like how how do you prescribe carbs um and what are your what carbs do you actually like and you think are are, are good go-tos uh let's do that first Sorry, what was the first one? Like if you're, if, you're, if you're putting together a nutrition program for one of your clients and you know that they're going to be working out with you for four times a week, 
Um, and obviously it's going to be depending on what you do. Cause I know that you do everything from yoga to strength training, but someone's active four days a week. Um, and they're looking to just optimize. Um, and you say to that person, I'm just going to tell you to eat a gram of protein per, per pound of body fat or 0.75 or 1.25, depending on what they are. Mm -hmm. How do you tend to look at their carbohydrate intake? For an active person, I think it can easily be in the one to 1.25 range. I know that for bodybuilding people, even people who are very, very lean will go up to 400 and 500 grams of carbs, which is fine. But I think when you approach diet, you want to approach sustainability. And can you go out with your friends and have dinner with your friends or family and not be that guy that <laughs> special orders, everything like how, how obnoxious or, you know, maybe you're at a table of everyone who eats like you and you feel comfortable with that, whatever. Um, I think carbs, um, either one to 1.25 of body weight for an active person makes sense. It helps give you energy and helps recover your system. My favorite form of carbs, I love oatmeal. Um, so I will often do oatmeal in the morning. I love a buckwheat noodle, like soba noodle. I do about a quarter cup of white rice mixed with a bunch of veg. I Famously, just do the lazy lunch of some kind of veg bowl and protein. So I think that's a really easy source. When it comes to getting carbs, the right kind of carbs from your fruit, just stick to berries. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to gain muscle, fruit is not bad. Fruit is an amazing source of energy, but like an apple has. 50 50 carbs and sugar. So, is that the healthiest choice for your green juice? No, it's not. There's nothing wrong with eating an apple. If you want an apple, maybe add some nut butter and a bit of cinnamon because that's going to help slow the spike of blood sugar. So, nothing's bad, but it's the way in which you eat things. So, getting some carbs from berries is a really great way to kind of build your energy and not spike things. So much. You know, it's so interesting you say that. I, I mean, I am an Apple fanatic. I'm a massive Apple fan. You know, there are 30 grams of carbohydrates in a, in a regular Apple. I mean, they, they, that's just, that's just the nature of it. There is. And I could, and I never, ever come even close to feeling satiated after eating an apple ever. I love apples because I'm a carbohydrate nut. Um, and I just love the flavor of apples. I always have. I love a crispy, crunchy, delicious apple. Um, but the truth is, is Honeycrisp. that Honeycrisp is, that's it. It's the one. Uh, but it does nothing. It, it really does nothing for me in terms of satiating me. Um, it's, a, it's really just a guilty. It's, and I know it sounds crazy to say because it's fruit. Eat a fucking apple, right? If you want an apple. But um, I agree with you that like there are other forms <clears throat> of fruit that will um, probably not fill me up in any which way, shape or form, but offer me greater benefits than an apple will. Um, can you just give us a list? I, and I know that this is kind of, you know, annoying, but I would love to just hear a list of your proteins, your carbohydrates and your fats, um, and then whatever snack you like to have. Because I think people just, so a lot of people just need to be told what to eat. They just need to be told what to eat. A lot of people don't have, don't know, you know, what to, what to eat, especially if they're trying to, um, trying to change. And I think a lot of people are trying to change now with this whole pandemic. People are really looking at health and wellness as like an option for them. And they're, they're intimidated because they just don't know what to do. So if you had to write a list of proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and then snacks for people, what would that be? Okay, so for protein, I love uh, collagen. If you just make sure that your collagen, if your cows do not come from America, America does not have the healthiest happy cows. Um, chances are that's why there's warning labels on a lot of American collagen products um, because they tend to have a lot of lead. So make sure that your collagen is from a really good source. Um, and I think it's really a bio bioavailable. Your body digests it really well. I like eggs. I love cottage cheese. 
if yogurt works for you, that's a great source. And I often reach for salmon or beef for lunch or dinner or some kind of fish. Uh, the smaller the fish, the less chance of mercury overload. So if your fish is not that old, it will have less um, problematic issues with it. Um, when it comes to fat source, I often, oh, cheese is also, so along with cottage cheese, cheese is a great source of protein. If you halloumi, it's very salty, but is very high in protein. I often add feta or some kind of seed to salads and things to add a little bit of protein and some fat. Fat can often come in avocado. I love pecans and just olive oil. Um, sometimes I use uh, coconut oil or coconut milk. I do a lot of dolls and curries. That's a great way to get a ton of veg and some fat. So if you're using root vegetables in your curries, adding some coconut milk will just help stabilize that spike of blood sugar. When it comes to snacks, if you didn't have cottage cheese for breakfast or yogurt, there you go. Or I'll just do a handful of almonds. Almonds are not my favorite. It's really hard to binge eat almonds. So you can, for me, I can very easily have 10 almonds and not need more because they're fine. They're not great. It's really easy sometimes to, if you don't give yourself your favorite thing, you give yourself something that you're like, okay, that was fine. Maybe that's the thing that will keep you from binge eating or overeating that thing. Um, I think often when people, especially if you're taking away animal protein as your protein source, often overeat certain vegetables like um, your cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage. Those are all really great for detoxifying your liver, but they're also really bloating. So when you're trying to lose weight and you're eating all these vegetables and you think that you're like, I'm trying to lose weight, but you're constantly bloated, chances are you're not metabolizing or able to break down these super healthy vegetables that you're over consuming. And then being aware that certain foods can affect your hormone balance more. We talked about chicken earlier. Chickpeas can affect your estrogen levels. Soy products can affect your estrogen levels. So that's definitely something that you want to be aware of. Some people, some cultures, metabolize food differently. Some cultures metabolize soy just fine, but if your body is not used to it, you may have a reaction and you want to kind of trace it back to where your food came from. I think lentils and beans are a great way to get some protein, some fiber, some carbs, but again, it's easy to overdo those things. Mm. And then, and then lastly, carbohydrates, what, what do you, what do you love for carbohydrates? So carbs, I like the, the oats, the soba noodles, um, and rice. I like a white rice over a brown rice. I think the fast digesting availability of food makes it more usable. I, I want something that gives me quick energy. So I feel good. I feel satiated. If it's slow digesting, chances are I'm going to overeat before I recognize that I'm full or that I've had enough. Um, also sweet potato. Sweet potato is a great thing, especially as a snack. If you add like a bit of nut butter on a sweet potato and a couple berries, you're good. I love sweet potatoes. All right. I know I only have you for a few more minutes. Um, so I just want to quickly get into sleep and then we'll wrap this thing up. Um, tell, tell me about sleep. Tell me what time you go to bed. Tell me what time you wake up. How important is sleep to you? How many hours do you think we need to optimize? I, I would love to go to bed at 10. I think I actually go to bed around 11 and I wake up at six because I am an absolute morning person and I wake up bright eyed and bushy tail. <laughs> um, I think the quality of sleep is so important that when you wake up in the middle of the night can give you feedback of information. So learning to pay attention to the feedback that you're given, waking up in the middle of the night because you have to go to the bathroom is not something an adult should do. That tells us that there's something going on. You don't wake up because you can't hold your bladder. You wake up because your cortisol kicks in and you're like, I'm awake now. And you're like, 
I, I guess I'll go do something. I guess I'll, and chances are, yes, you do have to go to the bathroom. That's fine. But as an adult, you physically can hold it through your sleep. That's not the thing that woke you up. If you didn't wake up, it wouldn't have happened anyway. So making sure, and sometimes that means for people to have a routine that kind of calms them down at night, whether that's reading or writing, doing something intentional, it's different for everybody. Some people can watch a TV show that's calming for mm -hmm. them, and that's the disconnection they need between work and sleep or family and sleep to set them up for a restorative sleep. Is there, do you have a, uh, like a, like a, a sleep routine? I, I am one of those people who can fall asleep anywhere, any place at any time within seconds. Like I could standing just fall asleep. Um, so no, but, um, I, I love to read before I go to sleep. I think that disconnection of, I know that I am happier every day when I spend 20 minutes reading. Um, I think it's a matter of just taking that time for myself to, to dedicate to something that I know makes me feel good. That alone is just calming for me. And that kind of helps set me up for sleep. And so you, you, you read 20 minutes before bed pretty much every night. Yeah, I try to. Yeah. That's great. Um, last question Two more, actually two more, and then we're done. Um, Habits are a massive part of my life. Habits pretty much are everything in my life. Uh, I think habits are what make us or break us. And I would love to learn of a few habits that you have been doing for a long time or that you just have started doing that you really love that have helped actually change your perspective. So the lime and salt water actually is something that I started to do like six years ago. I followed um, my mentor at the time, Charles Poliquin, followed him to Australia to learn under him. He, is, he was a strength coach, um, world-renowned strength and nutrition coach. Um, so that was something that I got from him. I have a really nice internal self-talk. <laughs> I am not mean to myself. I know some people really benefit from bashing themselves when they work out and kind of for me the sensitivity and the gentleness of my internal voice changes how I deal with other people um, I think that is really really important it's important in how you communicate with other people and I think it's important in the energy that you give back to yourself that's so interesting I love that habit is there something are, are you cognitive about it um, like, is there a voice in your head that starts going off in a negative way? And then you have another voice that you kind of like throw at it to, to, to say, stop bad voice. I really, um, I, I have, no, I don't really have this negative voice in my head telling me a certain thing. Um, I don't really combat myself in that way, but I know when I first learned how to meditate, having that conversation with myself of, you start making a checklist and your head starts going in different places and just that voice of being like, hey, Chell, you're trying to meditate. And I'm like, oh, right, okay. Here, and then I'll return to my mantra and just like that friendly reminder that's like, hey, actually your intention's this. Hey, you're trying to do this. Like, stay focused. Like, even if you're scrolling, right? The reminder that I'm like, oh, hey, Chell, you're trying to spend less time on your phone. I'm like, oh, right. And I just put it away. It's just that like, um, so, it's never a negative or a positive trying to overcome a negative. It's just a friendly reminder that you're trying to do things differently. Mm. I'm going to take that one. I like it. Um, you're amazing. I really, really appreciate this conversation. I think there's so, so much gold here uh, for me and also for anyone that's listening. Um, I've definitely learned a bunch. I always finish with the same question. And I know that we didn't get too deep into your story. We, we got a little bit more into the Q&A kind of podcast. Um, but do you think you were born with the ability or the interest or the, or the, 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 the you know, the, do you think you were born with this shit or do you think you were made over time? 
I think absolutely I was born with it. I, for me, it was something that it's, my internal voice has always been pumped and has always been driven to a physical nature and to a, a way to connect other people to better connect with themselves and their body. So I think that for me, it just came, came with the package. You're amazing, Chelsea. Where can we find you? Where can people find you online? Uh, at Wilco Journal is my blog. It has some good health and travel information or on my Instagram, Chelsea Wilkins, uh, C-H-E-L-S-E-Y-W-I-L-K-E-N-S. I'm so grateful for you. Thank you so much for taking the time. I appreciate it. We, we got it all in and uh, I can't wait to see you soon, Chelsea. Have a great rest Thank of the day. Thank you so much for having me. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. That was great. We got a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of good good stuff.